let's talk about mannerist, uh, the mannerist style and how it appears in portrait painting. Okay. So uh, well, this is by Bronzino? This is a painting by Bronzino. This is uh, called A Portrait of a Young Man from around 1540. Uh, we don't know exactly who it is, and it, therefore it has that title, and it's located in New York City at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So we can all go see it. We can all go see it if we're in New York, yes, absolutely. You know, it looks so elegant, and so immediately I think of mannerism. Yeah, absolutely. The elegance of the image, both in terms of the way that it's painted and in terms of how this young man presents himself, uh, are two of the things that really stand out. So actually, maybe we should start by saying in general what some trademarks well, of mannerism are and how this relates to it. So that elegance. Okay, elegance is definitely one thing, a, a kind of hyper-sophisticated elegance. Um, other things that are typical of mannerism include a very enigmatic quality, a puzzling quality. Right, things that don't make sense. The harder a mannerist image is to understand, the better it was right. to a certain extent. And they seem to almost make things confusing on purpose. Absolutely. Right? Um, and then also another important characteristic of mannerism, and we could say this about sculpture as well, is that the artistic virtuosity becomes an integral part of the work of art's mm. meaning. Um, some people call mannerism the stylish style, not only because of the subject matter and how it's presented, but also because of the creation of the work of art and its technical difficulty, uh, the kind of fireworks display of technical skill and, is also important. And aspect. sometimes I think that it almost seems like if they did things wrong, they were kind of showing off a kind of sophistication in an odd way. Absolutely, or at least making you wonder if they did it wrong is part of right. uh, what a like, mannerist artist might do. I thought I remembered one artist writing to another one, next time you do a, a, por a painting of the figure, put the right hand on the left arm. That wouldn't surprise <laughs> me. <laughs> to do it wrong, in a way, doing it wrong proved that you knew how to do it right yep. so easily Absolutely. that it was a kind of showing off to do it wrong. Sure, sure. <laughs> um, and also we should say these characteristics, uh, the reason why they emerged, there's lots of different theories people have, and in part perhaps because a new generation of artists, starting with Pontormo, but then also Parmigianino and Bronzino, they needed to do something different. They felt like all the possibilities had been exhausted in the high renaissance, the works of Leonardo and Michelangelo and Raphael yeah. and Titian. Well, it does kind of seem after the School of Athens that the height of naturalism right. of what the renaissance wanted to do had been reached and what, what was there for new artists to do. And so a new generation of artists turned away from the priorities of naturalism and classicism and overriding logic that we saw in the earlier 1500s. Also, Mannerism can be tied to the Medici, uh, both in terms of the election of a Medici Pope, uh, Leo X, in 1513, but also the return of the Medici to Florence in the teens and especially in the 20s so and the 30s. what was it about the Medici? Well, when they become popes and when they return as dukes of Florence, ultimately, they cultivate a very, very sophisticated court because they want to mm. prove that they are peers of the great court rulers wow. of Europe. And so the Mannerist style develops in a way in partnership with these efforts of their leadership to create a, as I said before, a hyper-sophisticated, elegant setting for their court. So the Medici are no longer pretending to be allies of the Republic, and they're really, no. in a way, embracing a kind of aristocratic yes, certainly, lifestyle. Certainly by the middle of the 1500s, uh, definitely. Okay. So let's talk about how this image yeah. uh, reflects these kinds of ideas and themes. Uh, first of all, obviously, the way the young man is dressed, uh, the way that he's standing, the expression on his face, all seem to exude this very cool detachment. sophistication, yeah. a great detachment, um, and a, a hyper-articulated elegance. Um, all of these things are, in a way, characteristic of both Mannerist life as it was lived and uh, Mannerist art. We can also talk about the way that it's painted. Uh, Bronzino uh, is one of the masters of the oil painting technique of the 16th century, and when you're standing in front of this painting and looking at it, it's hard to see how it was actually painted. Uh, you can barely see any kind of stroke. brush stroke mm -hmm. or any kind of surface texture. So polished. And exactly, it's as if he's transcended the medium itself in its <laughs> uh, in its creation, mm -hmm. uh, which was also definitely a goal of a Mannerist artist. Right. Um, what else could we say about it in well, terms of Mannerism? I mean, he, he looks you know, very distant, very detached, but also in a way very posed to me. Like this is not a position that one would catch 
one exactly. in he hasn't naturally. Been caught off guard. No, he's <laughs> he looks like you know he looks very much like a model, sort of taking a pose. That's true, and that's an important part both of Mannerist culture as it was actually lived and Mannerist portraiture. The idea of the pose, the conspicuous nature of posing, was actually something that people looked upon favorably. It's so weird because we kind of look down at it. We think people are insincere. We have a different take on it, certainly, right. but at the time especially in the Medici circles of this period, obvious artificiality was a goal of proper mm. social behavior in elite circles. Um, your identity was something that was to be performed. You presented yourself to be seen in a certain way, mm -hmm. uh, and it was understood to be a performance, something artificial. It was supposed to seem effortless, uh, but it was supposed to be clear that the real you, whoever you were, was not something on display. Mm. Uh, that would be gauche. Instead, a very polished, artificial, uh, superficial kind of performance is how you presented yourself in these court circles, and as we can see, actually, in this painting as well. So a kind of mask. Absolutely. And the, that kind of fits in here. Mannerists were obsessed with masks because of this idea that it presented something to be seen and was obviously hiding something underneath. Um, this painting addresses those kinds of themes in several ways. First of all, because of his conspicuous pose as we see it. And, you know, usually a portrait is to present someone's physical appearance and identity, but the way he's looking at us, it's almost as if he's saying, I dare you to right. understand who, who I, I am, am right? uh, which is very, very He also typically seems to be mannerist. condescending to us in a way. <laughs> Perfectly, absolutely. Um, and so there's all of that just in the way that he presents himself. It's typically mannerist, but to return to the idea of the mask, there are several masks or references to masks in the painting. Some people say that his hard, kind of porcelain-like skin mm -hmm. uh, makes his face look like a mask, yeah. especially because his eyes don't look in the and same the direction. That, and also the way that his the light sort of falls on his yeah, face. It is very, very mask-like. But then we can also look at the uh, face that's like a mask at the edge of the table, facing out towards the viewer. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's another one on the arm of the chair right. in the lower right. And then if you look very carefully at the very bottom of the painting, the folds in the fabric of his pants ah, leg yes. form two eyes and a nose and another mask, therefore, wow. uh, in the painting. And this idea of things being hidden and you have to search for the meaning and suddenly discover and things, things not that you making hadn't, sense. And things not making sense. All of these are important right. characteristics of mannerism. And we could talk mannerism. about the book in that case, right? Because normally what would be in a portrait would help to tell us something about the sitter. Right. And, and in this case we kind of don't have anything except those masks. Here we see a book, but it's closed. It's not open for us to read and understand, just like how we are presented with a man, but he too, because of the way he looks at us and is painted, is closed off to us. And remains an enigma. Like the window or door in the back that's also hidden from view in right. a way like the book is closed. Let's look at our other image as well. Okay. This is Bronzino's portrait of Ludovico Caponi, approximately the same date, and also here in New York City. This is at the Frick Collection. His fingers, those elongated, boneless fingers, are also very typical of mannerism. It's very similar to the last painting we looked at, and mm -hmm. to mannerism in general, with its refined elegance and the rather elongated uh, forms, the, the face, the cool polish, and the sort mm -hmm. of firm skin that we expect to see. Um, here he's not quite as aloof looking as the last image, yeah. but still there's that sense that he's posing for us. He's presenting himself to be seen in a particular way, and we're never going to know who the real person underneath is. And so again, a kind of virtuistic painting, uh, but also a very good demonstration of how you were supposed to behave in upper class society. Mm -hmm. Just like in the last painting, we had a book that was closed, so we were presented with something that we expect to understand, but are prevented from seeing into it. Here too, we have the same thing. In his right hand All on right. the left, He's, He's holding. holding a cameo, and usually when a man is painted in a portrait with a cameo, we see who it is because yeah. it's his lover right. or some family member, right. and here he holds it. We expect to see it and understand it, but he also covers her face with his yeah. finger. It's so fascinating how mannerism evolves this style. It's so different from the goals, the naturalistic goals of the Renaissance. Yeah, and when you think about mannerist portraits like these, in your head you can compare it to something like the Mona Lisa, mm -hmm. where she's not obviously posing. Uh, and Leonardo's effort in a painting like that is seemingly more honest and open, and she's engaging with you in a kind of expressive way. Right. Whereas in these mannerist portraits, as these two as well as many others, uh, 
you are presented with someone, but at the very same time, you're precluded from understanding who they are. Yeah. Do you think that this has anything to do with the Reformation that's beginning to happen or not yet? I or would more, say more it's with too court life. early it's, uh, for that. I think it has to do more with court life, uh, especially because these are such secular images. That's yeah. true.